It's great that we have the cycles because what happens is those who really are willing to learn and put the effort into it, they win so much bigger when it turns around. Why not put the effort into it? You kind of have to or just get out of the game. already know and I've already done an introduction, but I just simply have to chuckle because you know, I always launch the episodes with this question, right? What do you do and how, how did you get started? Well, more than likely you are very familiar with the name Tom Wheelwright already, and you know what he does. So I'm kind of chuckling to myself about this, but I'm going to stick with the protocol and I'm going to ask the question because this is actually going to be kind of fun. Hey, Tom, I'm super excited to have you here. And I am curious, what do you do and how did you get started? Well, it's it's very simple. What what I do is teach entrepreneurs and investors how to permanently reduce their taxes, um, by 10 to 40% and typically in three months or less. So that's what we do for a living. Dang. Okay. How did you get started though? You know, I started, actually I started in my uh, dad's business. He was a printer. And uh, when I was a teenager, I worked in the accounting department at uh, his printing company. And that I, I, I have to trace it back to then. That, that's when I really got started. Um, you know, uh, just, uh, just quickly, I did spend two years as a Mormon missionary in France, uh, uh, learning how to get rejected in French. Um, so <laughs> I, I, that was, that was, that was really the, the best entrepreneurship, um, a course, uh, graduate study I've ever done, uh, cause right. you are in it all the time. And if you can sell religion, you can sell anything. And uh, and then I, I, of course, got my education, my graduate degree in tax. And then I spent seven years with Ernst & Young, and including three years in their national tax office. I spent uh, four years as the in-house tax advisor for a Fortune 1000 company. And I, um, so in that company, I was hired because they needed a real estate tax expert. And so that's actually why they hired me into that Fortune 1000 company. And then I, um, you know, I bought, uh, built, bought, sold CPA firms for about 25 years. Uh, for the last five years, I've been building a network of CPA firms, and we recently launched our WealthAbility franchise. So we're officially a franchise um, in 40 <laughs> states. Um, so very excited about that um, because now we have true WealthAbility tax professionals. Um, we're not just referring out to some tax professional that is tangentially related re related to us, but they're actually a franchisee. And then of course, as you know, I've spent the last 20 years uh, traveling the world with Robert Kiyosaki of Rich Dad Poor Dad fame, um, teaching financial education. It, it's a little good cop, bad cop. Uh, you, you, if you know Robert, I'm the good cop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a lot of fun. I mean, Robert is, a, you know, people ask me about Robert. He is exactly what he seems. He is true to himself and true to his message. And I love him with all my heart. And uh, despite that, you know, he's controversial. And I think that's great. Uh, be, be controversial, be yourself, um, be true to yourself. Uh, frankly, what I write in Tax-Free Wealth, um, he asked me to write a book about um, 12 years ago, and I wrote Tax-Free Wealth. And it was the result of that. And uh, it's been number one since. So it's uh, it's been a, a nice, it's been nice. And now we got, now we actually have some, um, not just social media, we actually have teenagers on TikTok promoting tax-free wealth, which is so cool. I, I get people coming up to me and saying, my, my, my daughter's in graduate school and she'd really like your autograph. And I'm just going, that is so cool um, because it's really about, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's generational and it's just got to become more and more generational. Oh my gosh. I am. I'm just teary eyed because the foundation of the conscious investor, three tenets, health mindset, wealth, and in wealth, we view wealth in a different way. Tangible wealth. We're all familiar with intangible wealth. It's no different than Scrooge McDuck hoarding up a bunch of coins. It's just, you're hoarding up a bunch of experiences, but then there's transferable wealth, Tom. 
And that's what you have created because when we see this, like, you know, going throughout all the generations, like, I feel like there's so much knowledge and experience that we embody if we've lived a powerful life and to transfer that is the ultimate wealth. I'm so excited for you. <laughs> Thank you. It's great. It's a lot that's of fun. It, it, it's got to be a ton of fun knowing that you're impacting lives on that level and across generations. And no doubt there are youngsters teaching their parents yeah. like, mom, dad, what are you doing? <laughs> Have you not read? <laughs> oh, I love I'll this. tell you a funny one. You'll, you'll appreciate. I have, I have a buddy who's also in financial education, Andy Tanner, highly recommend him if you're trading stocks, um, not in the real estate area, but uh, his teenagers came up to him and he said, said, dad, and they're basketball players. One of them's almost seven feet tall. And, and they say, dad, you know, you really got to get with it on social media. You have no game. He said, now you should look at Tom, Wheel at, at, at our friend, Tom, he's got game. He's all over social media. I'm going, <laughs> how great is it for, to hear that from a 16 year old, right? <laughs> totally. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I am endorsed by the teenagers of today. <laughs> that is absolutely fantastic. And, and also congratulations on the franchise model, because what I have found is people, you know, conscious investor, you reach out to me on a regular basis asking for, I need help. I need tax strategy. I need somebody who can support me, especially you passive investors. You love your W2 jobs. You don't want to leave because they're great and you're making an impact but you don't know how to utilize all of these tax, re, you know, the, the tax opportunities that you have. And so, you know, Tom, I'd really love to dive into that and support these passive investors. They love their jobs. They don't want to leave. And sometimes they feel like you and I both know that a lot of times people in my position who are active investors will oversell a yeah. lot of tax things. And I'm like, Let's ask the experts. <laughs> let's ask Tom. So let's let's break this apart for our passive investors. Yeah, well, so so um, if you read Tax Free Wealth, Chapter Seven is all about the magic of depreciation. And if you read my new book, The Win Win Wealth Strategy, then you know that the um, uh, that one of the seven investments the government will pay you to make is investment real estate. So uh, real estate, the government basically says. If you buy real estate for yourself, we'll give you a little tax deduction, but if you buy it so that somebody else can live in it, we'll give you a big tax deduction. And that's what the depreciation is all about because you don't get that on your personal residence, but you do get it when you are providing housing for other people. And so it's really um, a, a fantastic tax benefit. They literally are paying you. The challenge that passive investors have in, and this is uh, one of my soapboxes, frankly, so I really appreciate you asking me this question right off the bat um, is, well, wait a minute, my tax preparer, my tax advisor says, I can't use those deductions because I'm passive. And I'm going, well, what I like to say is if you wanna change your tax, you have to change your facts. So what you have to do is you have to work with your with a, a good tax advisor. And of course, wealthability is the easy button, but uh, you work with a good tax advisor and figure out, okay, so how do I do this? So for example, um, one thing you might consider is, do I, you know, do I have a, do I have long-term renters or do I have short-term renters? So if I have short-term renters, that's Airbnb, right? That's actually a different tax law than long-term renters. So that's always one option for somebody who's got a W-2 job because they don't have to meet the same qualifications as the long-term um, as the long-term uh, real estate investor that, that's investing in the long-term rental, you know, the, the, the monthly rental type um, units, um, like an apartment building. Um, and then the other side is, okay, well, if that, so let's talk real quick about, since we're on the passive uh, term, uh, so the, the rule is passive losses can only offset passive income. And so what we always hear is, I'm going, okay, so how do I become a, a real estate professional, um, you know, right? So that I, so it's not passive. And I'm going, okay, well, that's one option. And of course that can either be you or your spouse. Mm -hmm. um, it is an argument for getting married. 
if you <laughs> if you're if you're if you're not married to, to your partner, um, you, you have to be married to get that benefit. Um, so, but one of you really just has to make real estate their primary business, just like it is for you, and that's one option. But the other option is, what if I turn my income from active income into passive income? So that is an option I never hear people talk about. I would and, like, did, you saw me go, like kind of have a, a <laughs> little, huh, yeah, take us down this rabbit hole because this is a solution many passive investors are looking for. It's, it's a huge, it's a, it, it's just, it's just crazy. It's really, this is why it's so important to understand how the tax law actually works. So if the, if the rule is passive losses can offset passive income, then one side of that is if you're a pessimist, you say, well, then I need to get rid of my passive, in, my passive losses, right? I need them to be active losses. I, I, I call that the pessimistic side. Um, if you're an optimist, you go, wait a minute. That means that all I need to do is change my active income to passive income, and then I can offset that. That's right. Now, what does it take to be passive income? Well, first of all, it has to be business income. That's actually the, the critical part. So what does a W-2 investor do? Well, could your W-2 job be a contracting job? Could it be a, a business? Um, one of the first rules about taxes is that businesses, business owners get all the tax breaks. Business owners get all the tax breaks. And in fact, the reason real estate gets tax breaks is because it's a business. That's mm -hmm. why real estate gets tax breaks. That's why the stock market doesn't get tax breaks. Invest in the stock market because you're not a business investing mm -hmm. in the stock market, right? You're an investor. But a real estate investor that owns actual property, you're actually in the business of real estate investing. So what we have to do is we actually need to have um, business income of some sort. Now it can be a business, you know, it can be a, uh, your home-based business. It could be your, um, it could be your, um, bricks and mortar business. It could be, um, or frankly, it could be your job that you turned into a business there. You know, I mean, for example, I'm, I'm a CPA, so I know all about owning my job, right? CPAs basically, they, they, they leave their job working for a firm and they go and they own their job. And, uh, and I've done that, right? But I will tell you, I have not been active in my CPA firm for um, six years. Mm -hmm. I haven't been active in my CPA firm. I, uh, in fact, in my current CPA firm, I've never been active in my current CPA firm because what I've done is I've set up a team and the team does most of the work. I work a couple of hours a week um, in that uh, CPA firm. I'm truly a passive uh, investor in my CPA firm. Yeah, it's got my name on it, but it doesn't mean I'm actively involved in it. Do I make some strategic decisions? Yeah, I do. But guess what? Once you understand the law, all you have to do is, well, what does it really say? Well, right. it doesn't say I can't make the decisions. It says I can't spend the hours. <laughs> okay. Well, so I can make the decisions in, you know, an hour a week. I don't, I don't right. need, I don't need to spend 500 hours a year to make decisions. I don't, the, the decisions aren't that hard, right? Especially when you have good managers and good and, and good staff and they can make those decisions. So in fact, one of the things we do in our CPA firm, um, which is one of the franchisees, of course, um, but one of the things we do in the free, in our CPA firm is we actually uh, give our, our uh, staff a lot of authority and a lot of responsibility. And that's because I have a big belief that people can do a lot more than we think they can do. And by doing that, guess what? Now, you know, we, now I can, I don't have to be actively involved in that business. So, you know, there's just a lot of different ways to do it. Um, but first of all, you have to change your thought process from, I have to be a real estate professional to, well, wait a minute, what, what are the other opportunities I haven't even looked at? This, that's so fascinating. And I appreciate this. My dad definitely taught me to be creative. Like even I I've been playing, this is silly, but it's to the point of, um, my kids and I, my, you know, our family's been playing cards in the evening and a game called nerds, which is super fun. And as we're playing this, sometimes the game will stall out. And I would literally say aloud, cause I, I hope this just is embedded into my kids. The answer is right before me. The answer is right before me. I I just need to see it. Right. And to your point, some people, 
we'll at the table, same table, same stall out in the card conversation. We'll be like, Ugh, this isn't working. You know, it's like, no, the answer is right before you. We just have to shift our perspective a little bit. <laughs> yeah. My, my mother, who was uh, probably my greatest influence, um, she used to tell us that uh, for any question, there's probably 50,000 answers. And we probably only looked at three. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So much opportunity in the world. Does this actually play out? Does this actually work for, for professionals? Um, like, let's say they've been working at, I'm going to throw a big company out like Boeing or something, right? They've been working at Boeing or Lockheed Martin and um, they're managing a team. Have you seen, and I, you know, have you seen that um, large corporations like that are willing to say like, yeah, we'll hire you on as a contract. Uh, you, you know, it, if you're managing a team of their employees, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but if you're doing a job that they could outsource, th this is the way I look at it. Okay. Uh, Cause I even okay. look at it with my own business, right? I mean, I have four businesses. So I look at my own businesses and I go, what could I outsource? And mm -hmm. really there's not very much you can't outsource. And so if I can outsource it, so could I be the outsourced solution for it? Mm -hmm. And what you're really doing is it's the business of you and you're starting the business of you and you're unique to the world. So why not start the business of you? I'm just saying, yes, that is, it's a pretty big fact to change in your life, but I don't think you have to stop doing what you love doing. Now, if you're, if what you love doing is managing people, great, start a business, bring in a, bring in somebody who can can do the strategic part of it and you be the manager. I mean, I can't tell you and, and or or find a business that needs a great manager. I'm telling you, um, I'm a terrible manager. Absolutely horrendous manager. Um, to me, um, being, uh, I, I was in management at the Fortune 1000 company and um, I loved the company, hated the job because I'm just, I'm just not good. I got people to report to above and people to report to to below. And I don't like being in the middle. Uh, it's like, to me, it's like being in a vice. And uh, I just am a, I'm just a bad employee, but I'm even worse manager. And so um, in every one of my companies, I have a manager. You know, you've worked with some of my managers and mm -hmm. I'm just getting, getting, working on this podcast, right? You've worked with yeah. some of our managers and they're really good at managing. So if you're really good at managing, that, you know, I, I kind of look at, um, all right, what, you know, what do I do better than anybody else? And what do I like doing better than, you know, better than anything? Well, okay, well, why don't we take that? And could you build a business out of it? Now you may not be willing to have to, to be the risk taker. Great. So find somebody that you can collaborate with who is looking for that manager mm -hmm. and you be the manager. That's mm -hmm. fine too, but it's still business income. So one way uh, that I was talking about the passive is you can be passive in your business. But the other is, is that you can actually have the ownership of the business be such that the ownership isn't you. So let's say, for example, so you have how many kids? I have two. You have two. Um, would you, uh, is, is one of your goals to pass on your wealth to your kids? Definitely. Okay. So any reason for um, you not to set up a trust that they own, that owns the, owns the business? Not at all. Okay. So do they actively work in your business? Yes. They do. They, it's, I mean, like they spend, not, they spend a lot of time in your business or do they spend a little time in your business? I would say a little, a little bit. They're still, they spend young, a they're still young, but okay. man, they, so can they talk spend a little time in your business. <laughs> they're probably passive under the tax rules in your business. So if, if they, if, if, if you actually had that business, if you had your business owned, through a trust that they're the they're the beneficiaries of, probably they're passive. So that income now is passive to them. Now you don't have to do that because you're a real estate professional, but a lot of people, that's not an option for them. My wife and I will never be real estate professionals. I, I have no desire to be a real estate professional. It's not my love. Um, I love real estate from a theoretical, I love investing in it and I love having, um, and I love the tax side of it but I'm never going to spend 750 hours a year in real estate. I have no desire to, I have other people to do that. And so it's always going to be passive. My wife has no interest in doing it either. So, so we have to find some other 
alternative to that. And one alternative is let's set up your business. First of all, you have to have a business set up. Second of all, let's set up the business in such a way that maybe you're, you don't have to be the owner. You can just control it. So, you know what, um, I think it was Warren Buffett said, own nothing, control everything. Right. So that, uh, yeah, it, these are, I mean, you're not going to do this without a really good tax advisor. Um, don't try doing this by yourself, right? This is, this is oh like the, gosh, uh, the, 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 this is like the car commercials, right? Uh, this <laughs> close course professional driver. And okay. you, have, you need a, you need to have a professional driver on a closed course. Um, but that's, you know, that's why you hire people like, you know, our, our, our people in our franchise so that you've got the professional driver and what you get is the result. Definitely. I, I love this. And I, I absolutely love that you franchised out because as I, I was saying earlier, conscious investor, I mean, you reach out to me and to know that there's a place where, no, nope, you can go to wealth, wealth ability and you know what you're going to receive and you know the philosophy behind it. And that's so powerful. And it can be very challenging saying, go, go out, you know, go to this firm here, but if they don't have the bandwidth and capacity right. to receive a lot of new, <laughs> a lot of new clients, it makes it very challenging. And so I just, I'm grateful that you have franchised out and you've gone through that. So it's going to be a win for everybody, which is good business, business done right. <laughs> well, we, 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 we think, we, we think we have the best clients in the world. And, uh, I think a better clients make for, um, a better life. So Definitely. It, it, everybody wins. <laughs> Every, yep. And when we win financially, that's a win. And when people get to offset their taxes, that's a win also. Now, Tom, oftentimes, um, the, like there is so much misinformation. I, I'm going to phrase this to you because you're so active within, you know, my profession, as, you know, the uh, real estate syndication space. So I know that, you know, that there's a lot of misinformation. So this is going to be fun. We're going to play a game. Called Great. misinformation. I've never done this before, but what are some things that you have heard that just, you are like, would you please shut your mouth? Hey, would you please not say that, that you would love to correct? Oh man, I, 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 I can give you a hundred of them, but I'll, I'll just start <laughs> rattling them off. Um, uh, first is don't take a tax deduction because it might raise a red flag to create an audit. <laughs> the number one on that is home office. I'm going, if your tax preparer is reporting, is uh, if your tax advisor has you set up in such a way that a home office is a red flag, then that should be a red flag that you have the wrong tax advisor. So if somebody tells you not to take a legitimate deduction, you got to go next. You know, like I need to find somebody else. Uh, so, so that's that's a huge one. Um, another one is um, with. Uh, um, uh, real estate, some of, some of the, the ones that I hear, especially syndicators are crazy. They're like, well, I'm the syndicator. So I'm going to take all the depreciation on the property. I'm going, you can't do that. You literally can't do that. The, the, the regulations are really clear. You cannot do that. And I can't tell you, I've been in major mastermind groups, people you would know. Mm -hmm. And, and, and they've got syndicators that have 5,000 doors and they're saying, well, this is, this is what we can do. And I've run it by my account, my account agrees. And I'm going, so if your account never even picked up the internal revenue code, even read the regulations, mm -hmm. the thing about tax law is conceptually, it's very simple. That's, that's why I could write tax for wealth, uh, win and wealth, because it's conceptually very simple, but the details are very complex. So you'd better have somebody who really has read the law. Um, I had one, I had one the other day. Uh, here's another one, deferred sales trust. You heard of, of a deferred oh sales trust? Oh my gosh. Yes. Let's go down that road. Let's go down that path. <laughs> <laughs> so deferred sales trust, um, the, the idea is I can have an installment sale and then take a loan out and have it be a non-recourse loan, have the money, but not pay tax on it until the installment sale pays out. I'm going, yeah, that doesn't work. Okay. Because while every step, if you look, some of these, and here's where to look at some yeah. of these step by step by step, every step seems to work. But what most people don't understand is that the IRS has the power to collapse all the steps. It's actually called the step transaction doctrine. 
So they can say, well, wait a minute, are you any worse off or any different off than if you'd actually just gotten all the cash? And the answer is no. Therefore, the answer is you're taxed on 100% of the cash that you received. So just because, you know, and I, I've heard this for years. In fact, they started using acronyms. Here's the, here's the other red flag. If you hear it in an acronym, that is a red flag. I've heard DST. I'm going, you're talking about Delaware Statutory Trust. No, no, I'm talking about a deferred sales trust. I'm going, well, Delaware Statutory Trust is great. It's, a, it's absolutely the best. There's another one, by the way. Let's talk about the good side of that. And a Delaware yeah. Statutory Trust is a great way to be able to do a 1031 transaction when you have multiple investors. Delaware Statutory Trusts are amazing, but you have to set it up that way in the first place. So that's a way to, because not everybody wants to do a 1031 exchange. Some yeah. of the investors do, some of them don't. You set it up in Delaware Statutory Trust. And it basically the way it works, um, the simple way to think of a Delaware Statutory Trust is that it is um, a tenancy in common with a master yeah. agreement. Whoa. So it, it's it's really slick. It's really slick. You definitely, you have to find an accountant and an attorney who who really understand uh, the details of it. Um, but it's really slick. If you're a syndicator and you're not doing a Delaware statutory trust, you you probably need to learn how to do that. I, when, you just heard that, you just saw by my expression, like, okay, I need <laughs> to go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> hey, wealth yeah, ability, let's that, have a conversation tomorrow. <laughs> uh, the we, the Delaware statutory be... trusts are really cool. Does that have to be set up um, like at the time of purchase? Yeah, pretty or much. You, you need to set it up before you get your investors and all that kind of stuff. So it, it, it's a lot of things, you know, people ask me all the time, well, what can I do right now? Well, you know, how you make your money, that's important. But what you do with your money and what you do in the future is way more important. Um, planning is always easier when it's in the future than trying to do something in the past, right? Yes. That That's called fixing a problem. That's not called planning. So, right. um, uh, you know, sometimes there are ways we can fix things. You know, and we always look at that. Uh, at, at the same time, the best thing to do is, okay, let's figure out how to do this going forward. Let's get it right. Let's do it the right way. So going back to your issues, um, Delaware, uh, uh, a, a deferred sales trust is one, doesn't work. Um, here's another one, PPLI. So um, this is uh, uh, private placement life insurance, okay? So conceptually, it works. The challenge is people get greedy. They get greedy. That is so human nature. <laughs> and, and so they want to have their cake and eat too. That's what, it, you know, an installment sale works, but a deferred sales trust doesn't. Why? Because you got greedy. You wanted all the money now, but not pay tax now. A uh, little greedy. I'll give you another one. So uh, the kind of the big real estate play right now is solar, right? Because you get a yeah. tax credit and a tax deduction. So, and, and I love solar. I have solar on, on my um, studio. I have solar on my, my office building. Um, man, I just, I'm in Arizona. So we have lots of sun and we have really high utility bills in the summer. So um, when, when we have the most sun, so it really makes a lot of sense here, probably, probably more than anywhere other than California. Um, but here's one I heard recently. And, um, and if, if, if the person who's promoting this, listening to this, they're not going to be happy with me, but too bad because it doesn't work. And here's We're the idea. We're truth tellers. We're truth tellers We're truth here tellers. on the show, exactly. by the way. Exactly. Yeah. So here's, here, here's, here's the idea. The idea is I'm going to be active. So it's not real estate, right? That's equipment. So it, you don't have to meet the real estate professional rules, but all I, ha all I have to do is I just have to put a hundred hours in the year I invest, but all my hours are going to be dealing with the investment. And then if I put in hundred hours in and I'm the only one putting hours in because I'm subcontracting everything else, then I should technically meet the rules for I'm not passive. So that means those depreciation losses are deductible against my active income. That is a, you're being too greedy. The idea of the solar is great. You want to go put it on other houses. You want to create a business of it. Great. The challenge is, is that the, the IRS is really clear. If all your hours are investment hours, you're not active. It, you got to be regularly active in the management of the business. You're not. So you don't get to do that. 
And that's one of those things that there are people probably listening. They're going to say, well, I heard you can do that. And I'm sure you can do it. I am telling you, you can't. And the IRS is going to shut it down. All right. So now the IRS shuts down things they shouldn't. So like a um, conservation easement, those are absolutely in the law or a captive insurance company, absolutely in the law. Um, but there are other things like, like, like trying to put a hundred hours as an investor and calling it active. I'm sorry, it just doesn't pass the smell test. And that's really what you have to look at. And here's the thing, you don't have to be greedy. You can get your taxes down. You can get a great return on investment without being greedy. I, I'll give you a perfect example. Why not just put that solar on your own bill on your on your own building? If you do that, well, if you're active in your own building, whether it's your business or it's uh, you know some or or you're a real estate professional, now you're going to get it. Now now it's going to qualify. You're fine. So, to me, it's you know, if it's you know, people say, well, if it's too good to be true, it's probably not true. I don't think that's always the case um, right. because I think people would hear me talk about tax free wealth and they say, that's, you know, that's too good to be true. I'm going, well, only a lot of rich people do it that way. And all I've done is made it available to the average person. So it's just the same thing that rich people have been doing for a hundred years. Um, but there are things that you go, if it sounds too good to be true, then get your tax advisor involved. Um, right. Another thing I would say is if, if it's something that you don't understand it, and they can't explain it so that you understand it, it, you probably shouldn't be doing it because they probably don't understand it. If somebody who understands something really well, have you ever noticed, Julie, that somebody who understands it really well can explain it so that anybody can understand it? So and true. It, it's, uh, it, the, I, I think it, uh, one of my, um, I attribute it to Albert Einstein. That's, I heard he said it, is that, any um, any six year old can explain something to a genius, but it takes a genius to explain something to a six year old. And so that's why you know when I'm on when I hear sixteen year olds ex talking about tax free wealth, I'm going, that's a that's a big win, because yes. that means it's simple enough that they that the teenagers understand it. That I I I think a six year old should be able to understand everything I say. I really do. And, um, and so I think that that's also something, you know, that's a red flag. You, you really got to be, be wary of people that are using acronyms, saying things you don't understand, trying to, to, to manipulate. Um, the other thing is people, uh, I had this just the other day, I was in my own mastermind group and, uh, not it's, it's one that I attend and people were asking me, well, what kind of, uh, scheme is this? What kind of vehicle are you using? I'm going, scheme. no. No, it's not a scheme. It's not a vehicle. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a paradigm. It's a, it's a thought process. It's yes. Something we do every day. And, and it's, and it's something that's been always, it's been available for years and years and years, ever since John F. Kennedy was really the first president to put tax incentives into the law. Now, most of the tax law is tax incentives. So if, if the government says we want you to do something, aren't we, Aren't we, can and, and we believe, now not everybody believes in the government, but if, if you believe the government's doing something right, at least the government believes that's right. So if I'm doing what the government tells me to do, how is that wrong? Right? And, and so- They're playing their game by their I'm rules. Just, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just doing what they're saying, do this. They're saying yeah. invest in real estate, we give you depreciation. They're saying invest in solar panels, we'll give you a tax credit. You know, they're, they're saying- yeah. Uh, build a business and we'll pay for you to build a business. Great. So uh, I'm willing to do that. Now, some people aren't willing to do that. They want to be silent partners with the government or as uh, Kiyosaki says, they want to be tax mules for the government. <laughs> totally good. That's your choice. Uh, but remember that you have a choice. That, that's what it is. You have a choice. And and I feel like it really is kind of one of those uh, matrixy red pill, blue pill moments for most people where it's like, nope, I'm not playing the game that way anymore. I'm shifting to your point. It's a paradigm shift. It's like, oh, wait, I can play the game this way. Let's go do that. That makes way more sense in my life. Let's go that way. Let me ask you this, Tom. 
bonus depreciation. It's so heartbreaking. My heart is broken, but I have this, I have hope because I'm an off, I'm a fellow optimist like you. And I'm like, okay, again, the answer is always right before us. And so as we lament <laughs> bonus depreciation being dwindled away over the next couple of years, and we're at 60% right now and everything, I am like, there has to be another way. There has to be some other great strategy. There must be something, or I, I don't know, but you're the person, you are the person to ask about what do you, what do you think about like, bonus depreciation sunsetting? And is that going to be debilitating for real estate investors or I'd love to hear your we honest. We have real estate before 2018. Right. <laughs> was real estate a great tax advantage before real 2018? Did we do cost segregations Always. and 1031 exchanges before 2018? Yep. Yeah, of course we did. It, it, it means that it's more difficult. It means that you have to spend more, you, you have to be more intentional with it. But if you think about it, so bonus depreciation is really just saying, um, we're going to give you this year what you would normally get over five years. Mm -hmm. that's basically what it's saying. Okay. Well, maybe we ought to just figure out how much do I need to invest? Because it's, it's a five-year problem. It's not a lifetime problem. It's a five-year problem yes. because once I've, once I'm in at five years, guess what? Every year it's a hundred percent. Every year it's a hundred percent because 20% after every year, after five years becomes a hundred percent. And that means that once I'm investing and doing that long-term strategy, that's why the long-term strategy is so important. But I will give you another, um, I, I give you a little hope here, Julie. There is actually a bill in Congress right now that uh, would give us back the bonus depreciation. So, um, and the R and the research and development deduction, which frankly is way more, uh, uh, much more important to the world than the bonus depreciation. Bonus depreciation is a gift. It's just, it is a gift. Thank and you. I um, agree with that statement right there. <laughs> right. I mean, it's a gift. It was five years at hundred percent. Oh my heavens. And, and then 80%, 60% prior to 2018, we did not have bonus depreciation on real estate at all. And I started my career in 1981. So <laughs> I'm going, it's like people who complain about a 6% mortgage rate. I'm going, I paid 16% on my first house. So I, you know, I'm like, uh, you know, what, what, you know, I, I look at it and it, there's, a, it's, it's really just, does it make it harder? Yeah. Okay. So be more diligent, just, you know, put a little more effort into it. I appreciate that so much because I, I feel like sometimes people are so busy looking at the losses and where things are going instead of saying the game is always going to be changing. There are always going to be nuances and it's just making sure that you're, you're adapting to the climate, to what is happening and making mm -hmm. some disciplined adjustments. But the challenge is we had 10 years of easy real estate investing. Oh my gosh. I mean, Appreciate seriously, it. seriously. Um, you know, my, my dog could have invested in real estate and made money in 2012 and 13. Right. And absolutely now, now you actually have to know what you're doing. What? It's a novel I, idea, uh, right? <laughs> I think it's great. I think it's great that we have the cycles because I think that what happens is those who really are willing to learn and put the effort into it, they win so much bigger when it turns around. Mm -hmm. So why not put the effort into it? I mean, you, you kind of have to, else you just, or just get out of the game. Oh, well, and that's what happens. I remember my dad entered real estate in the late seventies. And so he was into the whole creative space, but all, all this to say, you know, you're talking about double digit interest rates and that's what I heard about. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he's eaten my entire life. And when I was in residential real estate in the early two thousands and just watching what was taking place, it was so nauseating just because I know I watched my dad and grandpa work so diligently. And, um, I'm just thinking I'm grateful for flesh out cycles and I'm, I'm excited about this moment in, in time, just because it, when it's too easy, bad things happen. It's just a reality. Bad things happen and good people are collateral damage when it's too easy. And so I think it's so healthy for the, for the real estate world and in any part of the world, natural cleanse out. I agree. Oh, love it. Okay. We talked about bonus depreciation. Thanks for going down the rabbit hole with me, by the way, I was, you know, it's one of those things where I hear people talking about it and lamenting over it. And I'm thinking, 
every problem has a solution. It's not a big deal. We'll just move on. We'll figure something else out because it's worked, you know, all this time. Where, where do you see, um, over the next, you know, couple of years and things like that, do you see any major changes that on the horizon that you are kind of looking to, and I, we don't have a crystal ball, but you are very extremely well connected. And so I just thinking about, I could see these changes coming down and we should maybe start thinking about things in a different way. Well, I mean, you know, we're clearly in a down cycle and down cycles don't last just a few months. Right. So they, they, they last a while. So don't expect, don't expect we're going to come out of this um, in the, in the next six months. Right. So we're, we're in a down cycle, which means that we have, we're going to have opportunities, right. For sure. So, um, but from a tax standpoint, uh, I will tell you a hundred percent depends on, which party wins the White House and Congress in the fall? It's 100% which party wins. Um, it's very clear, no matter which candidate wins, on the Republican side, that they're looking at reinstating and, and extending the 2017 um, tax bill. That's what they're looking at. On the Democrats, they want uh, the Build Back Better bill that they trimmed down to $2 trillion. They want it. They, you're going to see it. If, if they really swept... You're going to see a, I think, six to ten trillion dollars, because you no longer have Joe Manchin. He's he's done, right? He's he's not uh, running again for the Senate. Kirsten Cinema could easily lose um, in uh, Arizona, so you don't really have the watchdogs, and those were the two watchdogs, and uh, they're gone or, or potentially. You know, Kirsten Cinema, mm -hmm. maybe not, but probably she's running as an independent, and. Um, so, you know, the Democrats sweep, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to be political here. I'm just telling the facts, right? It just is. Yeah, the, there's the a different facts way are, they, They've been very clear. I mean, the Democrats aren't trying to hide it. They're proud of it. Yeah. So, so Bernie Sanders is pretty much running the government right now and has for the last three years. And he wants more social programs and he wants to um, more taxes. And he wants, um, you know, I heard a, a great quote the other day that, um, capitalism causes unequal wealth and socialism causes equal poverty. Mm -hmm. And, and, Love it. and, and really all the, all the, all, all the socialists want is they want equal poverty. They just want everybody equal. They don't want everybody bet be, they don't, they don't, they're not looking for, you know, everybody to be rich. They want everybody to be average or less than average, right? That's what they want. Yeah. So um, if that's what you want, then that's how you should vote. I'm just saying that, I, uh, the, you know, taxes haven't come front and center in the election so far, uh, mostly because, uh, you know, Trump has avoided um, actually being part of the conversation with the other uh, candidates. So there's been no debate. Um, but I think that once you get into the um, into the finals, right, yeah. we're, we're in the prelims right now. But but what, what, once you get into the um, the actual race between the two parties, I hope taxes becomes front and center because uh, yeah. your your taxes are going to be impacted by the next election one way or the other. Oh my gosh. I just think about all the, when they were printing all the money during the, you know, 2020, 20, like the, the past few years, I've just been thinking like, guys, money is not free. You know I mean? like, well, that, and that's, that, that doesn't matter which party because both parties it's, print money. Yes. No, both parties do, but, but it's like, the taxes, there have to be taxes that are going to come from this, which is why right. we truly need to be investing strategically, working with a company like WealthAbility to develop that strategy so that we, we're we mitigating as much of our liability as possible. Yeah. And, and don't forget, the taxes have gone up considerably in the last three years via inflation. Inflation's the yeah. biggest single tax, and mm -hmm. it's the biggest tax on the poor and the middle mm -hmm. class. And inflation doesn't really hurt the rich. Um, mm -hmm. So all this inflation that we've had is really a, a huge tax on the poor and the middle class. And um, that's where real estate is so beneficial because it, you know, you, it's great for infl when you're, when it's in, when you're inflationary times, real estate's a, a great inflation hedge as is debt, by the way, debt is a great inflation hedge. What are the tax benefits of, 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 of debt? debt? Well, first of all, remember, uh, depreciation is our big tax benefit in real estate, right? Well, mm -hmm. so if I pay 
let's say I have $100,000 to invest and I pay $100,000 for a property. So I pay cash, right? We're talking about paying cash for real estate. And then my depreciation deduction is based on $100,000. But if I borrow $400,000 from the bank and buy $500,000 of properties, now my, my depreciation is based on 500,000. So I get five times the tax benefits with debt. So that's the first big, that's the first big benefit. Huge. Second of all, of course, interest is deductible specifically for real estate. It's an exception to the general corporate rule where only 60% of interest is deductible, but in real estate, it's hundred percent. So interest is deductible. Um, so that's an advantage of debt. Um, debt, when you refinance is not taxable. Mm -hmm. So that's an advantage of debt. And I, huge, huge the biggest advantage. advantage of debt, frankly, is, um, is I think, um, which is not a tax um, advantage, is that your tenants pay off the debt. So you don't have to pay off the debt. The, the tenants are paying off the debt. So I don't understand. Why, why wouldn't you want debt on real estate? I, I don't understand paying cash when you can have the advantages of, you know, having debt associated with it. It's so powerful. Oh my gosh. Tom, I have, I appreciate you so much. I know that we're coming, we're coming short on time here. I have one question for you that I just think is no so part. spirited and fun and you're fun and spirited. So I think you might appreciate this. The question, the, this burning question would be if you could write a tax law right now, we've talked about a lot of these different things. If you could add to the tax code, what would you want to add right now? It could well, be I anything. Self-serving even. <laughs> I, I will tell you something that will not win me friends. Okay. Um, the biggest tax problem we have in the U.S. is that we don't have a value-added tax. That is our single biggest issues. We do not have a value-added tax. Um, when you look at our competitive, our competitive, when we are, we have a huge competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Let me give you a simple example. Yeah. If Boeing builds a plane, hopefully with all the bolts screwed in. I was but just going to say. If, with if Boeing bolts. builds a plane and they ship it to France, right? They have to pay that. Then, then they have to pay a value added tax on the, the gross receipts shipping it to right. France. Right. Yep. Um, that's a 22% tax as high as 22%. So if, substantial. if, if, if Airbus in France ships a plane to American airlines, guess what? No value added tax because there's never a value added tax going out. Think of a value added tax, like a national sales tax. There's no value added tax on exports, but there is on imports. So, and that's on gross receipts. It's the gross number. So here you have, you have both Biden and Trump talking about 10% tariffs. Well, a value added tax would take care of that. So frankly, I mean, the, the challenge is I wouldn't ever want to do it. So it, it's theoretically the right answer, but the problem is that you would want to replace the income tax with it. But if you look historically, when countries have done that, that's what France did. They, they put in this huge value add tax, they re way reduced their income tax. Of course, now their income tax is back up because governments have an insatiable appetite for tax revenue. So I'm not proposing a value add tax, I'm just saying it is a big disadvantage we have Huge. in the U.S. Um, when we're we're paying 22% to when we ship it to France, but they're paying nothing when they ship it to us. So that's a bit of a challenge for us. And, um, uh, you know, that's something that, frankly, uh, ought to be corrected. But we tr Trump tried that. It actually was tried during the 2017 Tax Act. And just they they could not get any traction on it. So Trump actually tried it in 2017 and just could not get traction on it. But I, I know that's a little esoteric. Um, you know, um it's, right it's now fascinating. Right now, though, what I would hope is I would hope they pass the the uh, research and development deduction. We need more incentives for research and development, not fewer. Oh, agreed. And and well, and it's it's similar in application, correct me if I'm wrong, to, you know, the taxes that we were just talking about. I mean, like if other countries have benefits to their R and D, right. they're, oh, yeah. they're going to go, or our companies will go there to do let, it. Let, let, me, let me give you an example. 
Yeah. So um, South Africa, you get 150% deduction for every dollar you spend in R&D, 150%. What? Right? So if you spend a dollar, you get a dollar 50 deduction. In, in Singapore, it's up to 250%. In France, they'll pay they'll pay two years of a PhD salary in R and D. Um, our, we have the worst research and development tax benefits in the world. It's chapter um, Chapter three of my book, Win Win Wealth Strategy, is all, is about research and development, and and I do charts and tables for fifteen countries. We're pretty much the worst in the world when it comes to incentivizing R and D. Now we do it anyway. And maybe that's why they think we don't need incentivize. But the research and development tax deduction went away in the 2017 Tax Act. That was the worst provision in that tax law. Was I'll, I'll tell you the other one that they should do, though. They should just pay for it by getting rid of the state and local tax deduction entirely. We should not have a state and local tax deduction. So I'll go out on a limb on that one. I You can send me hate mail. I, I, I think that's a ridiculous deduction. I, I appreciate that. And I'm thinking as um, I was a public educator for 13 years. And so, you know, just thinking about that concept of um, how education in America, it lags so far, trails yep. so far behind the, the, the globe, right? And then when we think about R and D, and I think there's a direct correlation also oh, to these sure. things, like why wouldn't these kids want to flourish? Well, man, if, if they could see something and have that space to go to and have the jobs to go to, if we had more companies yep. doing R and D wow, down the rabbit hole we go. Yeah. I had a friend tell me the other day that his tax rate last year, because of this um, eliminating the R and D tax deduction was 80%. It was an effective rate of 80%. How about that for, 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 uh, for, a uh, a company doing a lot of research and development that means their effective tax rate about 80%. I, so, it's not your, your congressman. <laughs> nauseating. Oh my it's gosh. Awful. Tom, I thoroughly appreciate your commitment and dedication to, you know, educating my educator heart's happy, but also being a genius and making it accessible to youth because we have got 16 year olds that understand it. It's that's a, that's a gift. And I appreciate that transferable wealth into the world so that, um, it, these are important things that, um, conscious investor, as you think about this, and as you go click on the link down in the show notes and buy, you know, both books so that you can have back-to-back -back reading leisure, leisurely fun. Cause it is fun learning about how Absolutely. to play the game. So as you do that, like, take time, absorb this, because this is going to be very critical that you understand how to use tax codes um, going forward into the future as, as you know, things shift around in our country. And it doesn't matter who's in office, things will shift mm -hmm. regardless of who's in office. But, you know, don't go it alone. Don't, this is not a DIY project, right? Educate yourself so that when you meet with a wealth ability advisor, you have that base knowledge of understanding. You have some common vocabulary as, as we've been talking, Tom, there have been some things you've said that I've had to say, wait, what is that? And so like, it's important that we develop our vocabulary in this specific area so that we can really engage those conversations in a powerful way. Thank you. Um, you're, um, you're awesome. That was brilliantly you. said. Thank you. <laughs> Conscious investor, you're wonderful. Make sure you check out the show notes because you need to go connect up with a wealth ability advisor. And Tom, we'll put all the show, all the notes down below in the show notes um, as to where they can find you. But I'm curious, one last question. What's your favorite place for people to go find you? Uh, wealthability.com. And uh, if, if you do, you schedule a, a consultation, we'll actually give you a second opinion on your tax return. So we'll look at it. We'll let you know, are there things you could be doing? Okay. So take time, go take, you know, go to wealthability.com, schedule that consultation, just see what's, what's going on. Look under the hood, you know, don't just take, don't just take what you're given, get a second opinion on this. Um, it's a very powerful opportunity. Remember, adventure belongs on the trail, not in your investing. So make sure that you reach out. Let's have a conversation so that we can discuss what kind of investing goals you have 
And if those are goals that my company can support you with, great, I will support you with that. And if they're not, I know the most exceptional people and I love making connections and I love making sure that's done efficiently so that you can get your money working exactly where it needs to go. Okay. Until next time, cheers to health, mindset, and wealth.